Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live on the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about nature and travel photography. Our guest today is Jim Zuckerman. If you're not familiar with him, you should be. Jim is a busy man. <laughs> He's traveled to, what, 93 countries, right? right? So far, mostly leading photography tours. He's been a contributing editor for Photographic Magazine for over four decades. Yes. Decades. He has his own magazine, he has his own newsletter, he's got a busy blog, he's busy on Facebook, he's got uh, fine art photography exhibitions all over the place, his images has been in uh, National Geographic, Time Life, books, Outdoor Photographer, Life Magazine, and too many more to even talk about. So welcome, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> oh, and you also offer online classes. I and do. books. You've written, authored several, several books, right? 25. 25 books? 15 books in print and 10 e-books. Oh my gosh. It's amazing I have that much to say about anything. <laughs> I can't even imagine. What was your first book? Uh, it was called, well, the very first book that I'd never talk about, it was called Image Magic in 1977. But the first book book that I do talk about was, um, it was on composition, and forgive me, but the name escapes me right now. Ah, of your own book? Yeah. <laughs> so how come you don't talk about your first book? Peterson Publishing, at the time, was paying photographers $5,000, now this was in the 70s, to do a book, and it was mostly done in black and white, mm -hmm. and I'm a color photographer, uh, and the reproductions were very poor even by the standards then. Okay. It, it was cheaply done, but here's a lump sum of money. It was just... And that's a lot of money. It was a lot of money in the uh -huh. 70s when I was just beginning, so I did it. And it, it was a, an accomplishment, but I don't show it to anybody. But you're not, not that thrilled with it. Okay, I get yeah. it. I get it. So, All right, so let's back up. So you started as a professional photographer fairly young. Unless you're 150 years old and <laughs> uh, <laughs> you hide it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I decided to be a photographer um, when I finished um, undergraduate. I was going to be a doctor, and that I fell in love with photography. So I, I was, at 22, I decided. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty young, I that guess. Young. So how? I mean, did you just start taking pictures as a hobby, and or did somebody turn you on to it, or? Well. My first trip abroad was Europe. I went with a friend uh, when I was 20, and he showed me how to use his camera. And uh, in fact, I remember when we were in a cathedral, he was explaining that you had, we didn't have a tripod, so because the shutter speed was slow, you needed to stabilize the camera, and I rested the camera on his shoulder. Aww. <laughs> yeah, that, that's when I was just learning how to take pictures. That's cool. That's a good... He was a good photographer then that he... No, no, he was, he was just an amateur, but, but he, he knew, knew more that. than I did. Okay. Yeah. Actually, he was my sister's science teacher, so he knew technical aspects of photography, and he taught it to me. And I just started, for some reason, looking through the camera and trying to find more interesting angles on statues and palaces, and it just hooked me. And then when I came home from Europe, I bought my first camera, and... After about a year and a half, I, I just fell in love with it so much that I couldn't stand it. And I didn't want to do medicine. Oh. I had, had to do photography. N yes. And I never regretted it. Wow. Ever. Not, not, not one minute. Well, but how did your parents feel about that? Well, did you quit medical school? I did. Um, they, they supported me because they wanted me to be happy. Aww. Which I thought was very sweet. That is sweet. Yeah. It's funny you say that because my son is a musician and... Uh, I remember seeing when he discovered that this was it for him, and he was only about 14. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm not going to be able to stop him because <laughs> you never saw such passion in a person. And that's what it sounds like happened to you. It, it did. And as you know, if you don't follow your passion, if you just go for money or prestige, you may have the money and the prestige, but you won't be really happy. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to be happy, right. and I didn't want to be bored. My biggest fear when I was young and just starting out was being bored. Really? Going to, this, to an office job, 
every day, rush hour traffic, like so many people do, I just couldn't do it. If I did it, I'd be figuring out every day, trying to think, how do I get out of this? I don't want to live like that. Wow. So I knew when, when I was very young that I pursued what I really wanted to pursue. And so you moved to California from Michigan right around that time? or Yes. Yeah. And that was what you're, like, I'm going to California to be a photographer? Was that kind of the... N no. I okay. was going to California because California was very cool yeah. back, back then. <laughs> and um, I think young people think California is cool. Yeah, well, the, be the beach and the weather yeah, and the yeah. mountains, you know, all that. Um, and so that, that's where I began. And, of course, in the beginning, I knew nothing. So did you start, did you get like a job as a waiter or something, or what did you do? Um, I was a starving photographer for a long time. <laughs> um, I, I began using a book called Photographer's Market. Okay. It's still published. It's published every year. And from, from the early 70s until now, they list thousands of places where you can sell your pictures. Seriously, I never heard of that. Really? Photographers Market. Yeah, it's published we'll put by. Put that in the show notes. It's published by F and W Publications out of Cincinnati, and they list magazines and magazines you've never heard of, thousands of them. They list places in the music industry where you can sell pictures, stock agencies, oh, um, no. galleries, and and for example, with the magazines. They tell you what kind of pictures they buy, what they pay, who to contact, and it, it's it's a it's great. For for twenty one or two dollars, you have this incredible resource, wow. and that's how I started using that book. Oh my gosh! But you were working too, right? Like a real like a real job? <laughs> um, no. No. I from the very beginning. You were just starving. <laughs> well, I was able to make enough money to pay my rent. So you were working hard right from the beginning. You were yes. you were dedicated. You weren't doing this part time. You were just no. Not you were out there submitting your pictures all the time. Oh, and yeah. is that how you made money in the beginning? Just from submitting pictures to magazines, and they, but they don't pay as much now, right? The, they they don't pay a lot, but I lived very cheaply, and I made it work. Wow, wow. All right, so. Do you feel like you had, like when, did you have some like breaks along the way that kind of, you know, like, <sighs> oh my God, I'm so excited, I, you know? Uh, yes, I, I would say two. Okay. Um, an old friend of mine who's now like 95 um, had a newsletter and he, he advertised his newsletter. It was a newsletter on how to make money in photography, like one of the very first ones. Oh, wow. And he was advertising in Peterson's Photographic. Okay. And so he knew the editor. And he said, let me introduce you to the editor because maybe he'd like your pictures. Okay. And that was 1973. And I went up to their offices on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles in Hollywood and Right away, he picked. He's, I showed him a bunch of pictures. He said, what articles would you like to write about? And I said, well, how about this and this and this? He just said, OK, <laughs> just like that. Oh, my so, God. So right away, I had three articles, uh, photo article packages. OK. And so I would say that was maybe my first break yeah. in terms of getting published in a national magazine. And, and when, you write, when you teach photography, then you become an expert. Mm. Even though I was a beginner, basically, mm -hmm. um, now I'm showing people how to do certain techniques, and that makes me an expert. And then that segued into, well, how about a book contract? Oh. You see, because once you're an expert in a, in a national magazine, you can now approach a book publisher and say, well, I'm doing this, and now look at this. Okay. So that, that opened some doors. And how else did you make money in photography back then? Because I'm, I'm just curious more than anything because it's so different now. And, it, and, it, I, it, and actually, that's one of my questions. It's really different now. Yeah. I mean, I did do portraits of people. Mm -hmm. And I sold prints. You know, I, I went to galleries and had shows in the beginning. OK. Um, so I guess basically it was magazines and galleries and portraits. Um, what were you photographing back then? 
when you Sub subject started. matter? Yeah. That's a good question. In the very beginning, I was doing mostly special effects. This is before Photoshop, uh -huh. before we even knew the word digital. Okay. Um, I was doing special effects in the dark room and with slides. Oh. In the very, very beginning. So uh, give me an example. I would um, sandwich two slides together and rephotograph them. I would do double exposures. I shot infrared color film. Mm -hmm. I would cross process, which means you take slide film, which is um, developed in a line of chemicals called E6, mm -hmm. and process it in a line of chemistry called C41 for negatives. So you get like negative slides. I would do hi high contrast. What, what, what was the subject, though? Did you have a theme on the subjects, or was it just um, like all different kinds of things? Just like today, all different kinds yeah. of things. Okay. People, architecture, flowers, animals, okay. landscapes. So you would take a picture, and then you would go in the dark room and do something weird with it. <laughs> yes. Yes, sometimes biz ultra bizarre. Sometime, sometimes my mother couldn't look at them because they were too weird. <laughs> I mean, for example... It, it's strange to talk about film now because I've not I talked know, about this so for long. so long. If you take a piece of s a slide film uh -huh. and it's mounted in, in cardboard, you know, the cardboard mounts, uh -huh. and you take a match to it and you burn it, it bubbles. Okay. And then if you take that and you sandwich it with, a, let's say, a fisheye shot of a face, <laughs> oh, wow. you've got something that's pretty bizarre. Oh, my God. So that's just one little example. Ah. So you got a little bit of a crazy mind. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, but that's so interesting. You know, one of the things I think, you know, there's, especially now, there are so many photographers. You kind of have to differentiate, and it sounds like you did that right from the beginning. Well, but I, I always loved all aspects of photography, too. I did nature, straight nature, uh, you know, I, and I did um, the crazy stuff, and I did some nudes. I did... Flowers, everything. 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 And you still do. I, st much, I right? still do. Yeah. The yeah. only thing I don't do are weddings and bar mm -hmm. and, and and events. I do like ditches. <laughs> I, I, I could not do that. <laughs> it's funny because I know most the, of my guests, like travel nature photographers, they say the same thing. I like weddings, so. <laughs> I'm glad you do. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do them, yeah. Um, all right, so I'm all over the place. I was gonna. I had this list of questions to ask you, and I, I got I got distracted pretty pretty quickly. Okay, so how did you? Oh, th let's keep on the same theme though. Okay, so you were making money, well, writing you, books. You, you, you asked about a break. Oh, there, yeah, there's okay. one other thing. Uh huh. Um, a really good friend of mine was friends with somebody who was a partner in a stock photo agency, mm -hmm. and this was 1987. I had no idea that you could make really good money in stock, um, so I never pursued it, which was unfortunate. I wish I would have got in 10 years earlier. Mm. But uh, he invited this guy to his house, and I gave him a slideshow. And he thought I should be in their agency. And so um, he was telling me about how much money you could make, and I was amazed. Wow. I, I thought, I'm going to be in no matter what it takes. Uh -huh. And I went to, to see his partner, uh, and uh, the first two times I went, I showed him a bunch of slides, and then again, he said, you're not ready yet. And the reason why he said I wasn't ready is because I wasn't shooting for stock. Right. I was shooting for art, for composition, for magazine covers, but I wasn't shooting for example, leaving space for logos. Mm, See, okay. you have to think differently with stock. Oh yeah. And so I listened to him. I went back home and took a whole bunch of new pictures, went in again. He said, yes, you're in. And, and that, 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 see, once you're in stock and you're successful, you have a monthly income and you don't have to worry about Am I going to make money this month? Right. Because because the more pictures you submit, the more you make, and now you have a steady, reliable income, and that freed me up. 
oh, tremendously wow. to do then whatever I wanted. That's nice. It was a, a big deal. Steady income is nice. <laughs> it is, and, and you know most artists in, in music or photography or whatever don't have a reliable steady income. Mm -hmm. but, but stock gave you that. Well, it's different nice. now, yeah. as we all know. But but do you for still sell stock photography or? It still sells, but, but it's it doesn't pay as much now, no, right? Is no, no, no. It's a shadow of its former self, and yeah. I'd be happy to talk to you about that at some point during this interview. But it's drastically different because the internet. The internet, the internet's been a boon to a lot of things in photography, but it killed stock. Right. It killed stock because of the micro stock companies who began selling pictures for between one and five dollars. Yep. You can't make you a living that way. No, no. And so it doesn't behoove you to go out and spend thousands on a shoot when they're going to sell it for so little. Right. And the, the, when all the, the micro stock companies came online, the big traditional companies like Corbis and Getty started competing with them by lowering their prices and, and then it spiraled the photographers it, less and right yeah, yeah, yeah. it spiraled downward yeah okay so all right so let's keep on this theme so you have obviously weathered many changes in the photography industry yes because you've been doing it a long time yes so you got into teaching am I where's how did the career path go um because you were selling well I, I was teaching from the Almost oh, right from, the, from beginning the beginning, because the articles I was writing, that's teaching. Mm -hmm. And I did do some photography tours where I, I teach back in the 70s. Uh, my first one, uh, I formed a company with a partner called Photo Tours International back in 76. Wow. I know. And, and we did um, um, tours back then, so I was teaching there. I taught at, uh, at UCLA. Um, I d in fact, I taught a number of universities at their extension programs, okay. not, not for credit, just for adults who wanted to learn photography. Okay. And so I, um, I sort of carved a niche for myself in a number of universities, Kent State University, UCLA, and others. And I taught, like I said, for, for their non-credit uh, adult extensions. Okay. And okay. so uh, that's another source of income. Jeez. You know, yeah. and and as I'm doing all of this, more books are being produced. And so it just snowballed. Wow. Wow. So right now, what's your main source of income right now? Right now, well, let, let me backtrack a few oh years. Yeah. Okay, because we I, skipped over. I had three major, <laughs> three major sources of income, mm -hmm. stock photography, mm -hmm. teaching online, uh -huh. and photo tours. Okay. And now, uh, stock is almost gone. It's not gone, but it's almost gone. Mm -hmm. And teaching online has also crashed and burned. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I do photo tours. I've always done them. Now I just do more of them. Okay. Okay. And you know, the thing about, I, I love photo tours. I love because the people are fantastic. Th they're, they're interesting, interested, creative, accomplished, uh, well-traveled usually. They love to learn. They, they love what, what I teach them. And I take them to unbelievable places, and I, I, I sort of feel like I'm King Midas with, with n not with gold, but with photographs. I want more and more and more. Oh my gosh! And and all the tours I do, I get to keep doing more and more and more. Whether it's jaguars in Brazil, or or ice festivals in China, uh, it's it's always going to be phenomenal. So you don't get tired of that. Well, you just got back from China. What? Two days? Yesterday. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. Oh my gosh. Yesterday, yeah. I'm so jet lagged. I can't believe he's awake. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but you don't get tired of it? You just, I mean, that's a, how, uh, how many trips do you do in a year mm, approximately? 13 to 15. Wow. And I know they're all about a week or 10 days or do you have? Um, most of them are 10 days to two weeks. Oh my goodness. There's oh my goodness. I know. There's a few that are shorter, like my snowy all workshop is just three days. Okay. Ve Carnival in Venice is a week, but m most of them are longer. But y you asked if I get tired. Um, I go there and I look at what, my, what I'm showing my clients and you know, I go, oh my God, that's incredible. And it raised my blood pressure, uh, and there I am shooting. So you love it. I've you always still loved have it. that passion. Still have it. Haven't even slowed down. <laughs> it hasn't. When I think about retiring, 
it, it's it's stupid. I'd only retired to do the same thing. To do what? Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I uh, I took a road trip this year and I went to New Mexico and I was by myself. So I hired a guy. You know, I went on the internet, photo tours, uh, Albuquerque, photo tours, Santa Fe, that area, and I hired a guy. I, I actually had trouble finding it, which I was surprised. But I found a guy. He said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll, you know, I, I do photo tours." He's in his 80s. Wow. Yeah, and he just started doing it. Wow. He's like, "How can I take my passion for photography and make money?" And he's in his 80s. So that's I had a great time. He took me all these great spots that I've never been there before. So it was awesome. That's inspirational. It was fun. I, I wonder how many more years I can do this. Like in China, one vantage point that we photographed uh, Guilin, uh, a beautiful city there, uh, 500 steps to the top. Oh, yeah. 500 steps, carrying camera stuff. Yeah. And um, I'm 68 and a half now. And a half. <laughs> 60 and a half. <laughs> That's right. I had to get that in. And I'm still doing it, so we'll see. You look like you're in great shape. Because I keep climbing all those steps. Yeah, that's <laughs> carrying heavy equipment. That's right. Ay, ay, ay. All right. Let me get back to my script now that that just put me back on the script. S equipment questions. Okay. I have two basic questions. One is, okay, I am, you know, ready to start traveling the world and I want to start taking fabulous pictures, but I don't want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what should I buy? Well. And by like what what do you think the minimum budget is you can get a good camera and and, and a a standard lens like a kit for five hundred dollars okay or six hundred easy uh-huh um, like a canon body and an 18 to 55 millimeter lens mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to start and it's not much money right that's not much money at all no not not in photography world anyway. Uh, I know, I know. Um, so I, I would say like minimum five hundred. Okay. And you can you can go mirrorless, you know, um, get some really good deals on inexpensive mirrorless cameras. They're really light and small, easy for people who don't want to carry a, a big camera with them. So very very doable. All right. So now I've 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 done that. Now I want to get better. What's my next? purchase. Actually, Jim has all this information on his website. Uh, if you go to jimzuckerman.com, he's got, what is it, suggested gear or something like that? Uh, yeah. Something like that, right on your website. Yeah. Under the tab about, about Jim, I think it's in there. Okay. It lists stuff that I suggest or recommend. Um, the next step, you have to decide what you want to photograph. Because you're going to need different equipment if you're going to Africa than if you're going to Paris. Correct. Okay. Um, if you want to do architecture, then a really good wide angle lens is really important. And a tripod, of course. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to do lions and giraffes in Africa, then you're going to need a longer lens. Uh, like at least how, how long? What would be the minimum length, do you think? Minimum in Africa is 400 millimeter. Okay. And now, if you have a cropped sensor camera with a multiplication factor you know you could get away with maybe a 300 like with an icon the 1.5 magnification factor canon's 1.6 so a 300 becomes a, f a, f a 450 for okay. example with nikon okay. so but that's minimum though minimum okay what about extend extenders or whatever Tele teleconverters yeah well definitely okay I, i'd bring uh, at least a 1.4 uh, some people find the 2.0, uh, the, the 2x teleconverter, not as sharp. But my experience has been that it's quite acceptable, given what you're doing. Okay. If you have a 500, and the 2x gives you a thousand, that's that's really something. And so, um, I typically carry the 1.4 converter and the 2x. Okay. Both with me. Because they're not that big. No, they're, they're, they're not, not that, that big. Heavy. Right. But. If you're serious about wildlife photography, you love animals, you want to get the best, I would suggest a 500. Okay. Now there's... there's now you're a Canon guy, right? All I the am. way. All I the am. way. Canon yeah. all the way. <laughs> well, my, my, my first camera in 1968 was a Canon FTQL. 
Oh my gosh. Um, I, don't, I don't know what that is, but well, <laughs> well nobody does today because okay. they, you know, they don't exist anymore, uh, except in the history books. But yeah. but that was my first Canon camera. For a while, I went medium format okay. and Canon. And then when digital came along, I got rid of the mini format film stuff and just stayed with Canon. Yeah. Okay. And you use all Canon lenses as well? Or yeah, do you of course. Of course. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, all right. So what did you say? You think 500? Is it just a 500 millimeter? Well, or is it a zoom? Well, today there are choices. Okay. Uh, Nikon has a new one, 200 to 500. Oh, okay. Great range. That is a big range. Um, Canon has a fixed 500. Um, Tamron has a 150 to 600. Sigma has a uh, 150 to 500. And I think 150 to 6.2. So now there's a bunch of choices. Oh, I see. Okay. And you know, they can get really pricey and heavy. You know, airline travel I is challenging for photographers, and so. Um, I mean, like, for example, Canon has an 800. Well, uh, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And and you have to plot and plan how you're going to carry this stuff yeah. to get it there. And once you have it there, managing this monster is too much for many people. And the reason I got my 500 as opposed to a 600 is just because of the huge size and weight. Okay. The, the 600 is really heavy, even though it's lighter than the older 600s, it's, it's something to behold, really. I'm going to go off topic just for a second, because when Jim got here, um, he had a backpack that was empty <laughs> and his carry-on that was not empty. And you want to explain that a little? That's a travel, this is a travel tip for photographers. Well, when I was younger, I carry typically 40 to 45 pounds on my back all the time because what if I'm going to need that lens? Oh, yeah. oh. You, you know, you, you can't be in some exotic place without the lens that you really need. Of course. So I carried everything. And um, now uh, I've had back surgery over, you know, in 2001 and now I, I have to be really careful that I don't exacerbate any kind of problems in my back. And so now when I go th through those long airport corridors, I have a, a, f a wheeled camera bag. It has uh, double wheels each corner, so there's eight so wheels, it really. So spin around. It's, it's a sp <laughs> they're, they're, in fact, they're called spinners. Oh, OK. Um, made by Think Tank. Okay. And that, that wheels effortlessly. It's really heavy, but it's effortless. And then when I shoot, I have my empty backpack that I put what I, what I need for the day. Okay. Um, and also, uh, many airlines um, limit what you can carry with the weight you can, you can put in a carry-on. Okay. American carriers don't typically, but foreign carriers like Lufthansa and, and uh, Emirates, they do. They will weigh your carry-on. And that's a problem for photographers because our stuff is heavy. I know. And so if I have an empty backpack, I can take some out of this one and put in that and divide it and, and a photo, photo jacket as well. And then I can go on. Then I get in the airplane and I put all back oh, where it belongs. Back in the suitcase so you don't have to carry it through the next airport. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was the greatest travel tip. I never heard that one before. It was a really good one. All right, so now I'm rewinding back to what we were talking about because we're still talking about heavy equipment. Okay. All right. Now, I'm assuming that a lot of your, um, the people who take your tours are, I mean, sure, I'm sure you have all age ranges, but some of the people are retired, maybe getting older, maybe they had back surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, m many have had. I mean, do you have advice for people like that? Because what are we going to do with all this heavy, and like women, I mean, I'm, I'm not that strong. I was strong when I was young, but now, you know, I was talking about weddings, I used to, my first two lenses, I had my 24 to 70 hanging off of one, you know, with a camera hanging off of one shoulder and my 70 to 200, 2.8, hanging off the other shoulder for ten, a 10-hour ten wedding. I can't do that anymore. I understand. It's too heavy. It is heavy. <laughs> well, one thing you could do, for example, is trade your, your 70 to 200, 2.8 for an F4. Hmm. The difference is huge. 
As my, far as weight, you mean? As far as weight. My wife has the 7200 F4. I had the 2.8, and I sold it in lieu of another lens, but um, when I picked up her lens, it was like a feather. It was almost, it felt weightless. It was compared to my 2.8. Yeah. So that's one thing you can do. You can go mirrorless. You know, the mirrorless cameras, uh, and there's Sony and Fuji and Olympus, but especially Sony and Fuji have stepped up, and they have fine cameras now, really sharp, many frames per second, all kinds of bells and whistles. And are their lenses just as heavy, or are they lighter? No, no their lenses are much lighter. Oh, okay. Yep, very okay. sharp lenses, you know, Zeiss lenses, really super sharp. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and so that is, I, I'm looking at them. As a, as, a, as a backup, so something like to put on my waist and carry around easily. Mm -hmm. It's literally hard for me to give up my Canon. Yeah. You know, because th th they've been part of me for 40 years. Time, yeah. yeah. Um, but it, but if, if weight is a really big issue, and volume too, wireless cameras are smaller. You know, a little backpack as opposed to a big backpack. Right. So that's certainly an option. But there are lighter cameras and there's heavier cameras. I. I was trying to go lighter, but I just bought a heavy camera because it had features I want. What'd you get? The Canon 1DX Mark II. Oh. And I got it because the reviews said it handled noise really, really well, high, like high ISO settings really, really well. And based upon my China shoot, that's correct. I, I did oh, you used it in China? Because I followed you. You know, I was watching his Facebook and blog and everything well, while he was in China. I did some, some shots at 4,000 ISO, and the, the grain was really, the noise was really good. Wow. Really, it was, it was extremely impressive. 4,000 in the dark. Wow. It's one thing if you're shooting 4,000 ISO in snow where the noise doesn't show up so much, but if you're doing night photography at 4,000, and and you have to blow it up to 100 percent to see the noise. That that's something. Wow. It also has 14 frames per second, and I love taking pictures of birds in flight. Okay. And to get every nuance of those wings, you need many frames per second. Like that. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Canon came out with with a new uh, 5D Mark IV, great mm -hmm. camera, mm -hmm. but seven frames a second. Okay. It's more megapixels, which which is great. But I wanted, um, actually what happened was, two years ago I did a photography tour to the Pantanal in Brazil. Okay, okay. The, the main focus was jaguars and also birds. And we, uh, my local guy there would throw fish into the river, we'd be in a boat, and the kingfishers and the hawks would come down to get it. And there was a, there was a guy in there from, uh, on my tour from uh, Denmark, and he had the 1DX before the 1DX Mark II came out, okay. and he was getting 12 frames per second, and I had the, the 5D Mark III, which got six frames per second. Uh -huh. He had doubled the number of frames in one second. You would think six frames per second is enough to get that all the nuances. Sounds, yeah. Six pictures in one second. No, he not was, even he, close. He was getting better wing formations than I was. Oh, I bet you were jealous. I, I, <laughs> I was pissed off. <laughs> So, so I waited t till the, the successor of that came out. And it just came out last month, and I got it. So oh. I'm really happy, really happy with oh. it. But it's and heavy. But it's heavy. So you and so, you know, I said, okay, that's the price I'm going to pay. So basically, your advice is kind of <laughs> what you gonna have to sacrifice it, something. It, it's what so you, you have to decide what you want to sacrifice. What you can physically handle, <coughs> because if you can't pick up the the, the, the camera lens. <coughs> Excuse me. If you can't pick it up, then what's the point? Right. You have to be able to handle it. And I can still handle it. Maybe when I'm 80, I won't be able to, but right now I can. That's awesome. All right, now you are really into Photoshop, right? Really into it. Really yes. into I it. I live in it. So tell me about, first let's just tell me about your standard editing workflow. Because you obviously, you were gone to China how long? Two weeks. Two weeks. So you have how many pictures? Thousands. Thousands. So w did you process while you're going, like while you're on the trip, or do you wait till you I get I home? I didn't process all of them, but just enough to post and to get excited. And um, oh, let me interrupt one more time though. 
um, I followed Jim on Facebook while he was in China, and he posts a picture, and then he gives a really good description on how he took the picture, but not just like settings, but like I was just thinking about one of the night photography things you were talking about, how hard it was to focus. Yeah. I forgot what you said now, though. <laughs> what did you say? I, I focused on the moon. Focused on the moon, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, co okay, so, um, I lost my train of thought now. What were we, what were we saying? Uh, I was just, and I said, wait so one second, and then I got, oh, editing workflow. So you're going to. Oh, right. Well, many people use Lightroom. Uh -huh. I don't. Really? I don't. I, if I started in photography today, I'm sure I'd use it because it organizes pictures very well. But I use Adobe Camera Raw. It's the same thing. Well, kind of. <laughs> it's, it's almost the same thing. I think, uh, mo in my the opinion. The processing part, but not the. What do you, how do you organize them? Well, I, I'll be happy to explain okay. that. But I, I, I've been organizing before Lightroom was ever invented. Right. And so I have my system. Okay, let's hear your system. Okay, I, I have a hierarchy of folders. Uh -huh. My first folder is photo library. Okay. You open that up, and now I've got my major categories, nature, travel, Americana, okay. women, like that. So you open up travel, uh -huh. and now I've got the, the, the major categories in travel, Asia, Africa, Antarctica, um, North America, like that. Okay. Then you open up Asia. You've got Indonesia, Korea, Japan, China. Then you open up Indonesia. And now, now I have the subfolders in there, like, like Bali. Do you do them by specific trips? or? Um, I do them by... Or both? Well, n I don't do it by date. Okay. Because in the end, it doesn't matter if the picture was taken in 2005 or 2007. Yeah, and you can look up the and date on there later if you need it. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so I, do, so I do it by subject. China, for example. Okay, or le so let's say you're going to do your China pictures. You're going to put them in the China folder. Well, but within the China folder, uh -huh. we have tigers, ice festival, oh. um, landscapes, Shanghai. See? Then you open up Shanghai, and there's the pictures. So when you load your pictures onto your computer, are you in a Mac or PC? Mac. Okay. How do you load them on? What do you use? I have a card reader. And just load I them put the flash card in the card reader, and put a folder on my desktop and drag them, drag so the raw files over. So they all go into over. one folder first. Yep. And then mm -hmm. you just go through the folder and just move them like in, into the right in, categories. In Adobe Camera Raw, I look at the ones I want to process, uh -huh. process it, put it on my desktop, give it a number, and then put it into let's say the Shanghai folder within China, within Asia, uh -huh. within travel. Okay, 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 okay. See, so it's a hierarchy of folders. But it seems like it would take you a long time to sort them that way. Um, Are you f really fast at it? Well, I, I, uh, I am. Yeah. But what bothers me about Lightroom is you don't know where your pictures are. Have you ever tried the Canon mm -hmm. software? No. I really liked it. I had, mm. to, I had to go to Lightroom. I would have stayed with the Canon software huh. because it was so much easier to organize your pictures. But because I'm running a photography training center, I had to learn Lightroom because that's what everybody else uses. Everybody's so. using it, I know. Yeah. But, but all the sliders are the same in that, that Adobe Camera Raw and, Light, and Lightroom. That part is pretty much and the same. Uh, in my opinion, people do Lightroom because they're afraid of Photoshop. Most people tweak color and contrast and exposure and a little burning and dodging, and they're done. Uh -huh. Well, I, that's not me. You like to play with them. I like to make them perfect. Okay, so once you organize them, or do you edit them before you put them in the folders? Yes, I uh, do. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't put all the... Do you the throw away a lot of pictures? Um, well, I trash some, but, but I keep most of okay. what I shoot. Okay. Not all, but most. So what are some of your photos? Do you like a favorite things to do in pho Photoshop or? Well, replacing backgrounds is a big one. Okay. Really big be because backgrounds are just as important as subjects mm -hmm. in making a picture work. If you have a landscape with a white sky, 
You have a white sky. Yeah. Right? Boring. Boring. I, if you have um, a bird uh, with messy branches in the background, it's distracting. So you clone those out or I don't however, clone them out. Clone out. How, do I, you, how do you get rid of branches? Well, well, depends upon what's, what the picture is. Oh, okay. Um, but I do a lot of replacing of backgrounds, and you can't do that in Lightroom. True. Very okay. True. Um, I mean, I, when I when I when I give a, s a seminar, in fact, tomorrow here in uh, Fort Myers, I'm going to show this. Huh? Naples. <laughs> Is it Naples? Yeah. I thought it was in Fort Myers. No. Nope. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I have an elephant in tall grass mm -hmm. with a white sky, oh, okay. and I, I've always loved the picture of the elephant because because the, the, it, it was in Kenya and the track was below ground level, so the elephant seemed elevated. Okay. which gave him greater stature. Okay. And there's tall grass all around him, and um, some of the grass are in focus, some are out of focus, and the sky's white. Well, how do you replace that? Because you've got grass. Exactly. You can't cut that out like with... One wi blade at a time. <laughs> that might take you the rest of your life. <laughs> right. So I, sh I show a technique inv involving a layer mask that makes it Absolutely perfect, as if there was a stormy sky behind the elephant. Now, are you going to teach that tomorrow? I am. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a gr it's a great technique. It takes a few steps, but once you learn how to do it, it it's like a light goes on your head. You go, whoa, this is incredible. Now, for those of Okay, I don't think I mentioned this yet, but Jim Zuckerman is going to be here in Naples, Florida, doing a lecture and a class tomorrow, Saturday, uh, I forgot the date. October 1st. October 1st. Oh, my God, it's October. Um, so uh, we are going to have in the show notes the website, and we're actually, we're also going to put it right under this post where you can find information about tomorrow's lecture and Photoshop workshop with Jim Zuckerman in Naples, Florida. Okay, back. Got to do my commercials. <laughs> there, there, there's so many things that aren't perfect when you take a picture. Right. Um, for example, when you do a, a, a night shot of a landscape or a cityscape and the moon's in the picture, you cannot expose correctly for the moon and the, the, the landscape, right? Well, of course not. The, the moon no blows way. out. Right. Well, I just discovered a technique. Well, first, so wh what I do is I'll, re I'll replace the moon with another shot of a moon that I took separately uh -huh. that shows detail in the lunar surface. Okay. When you do a crescent moon, it's easy. But when you do a full moon or a gibbous waning or waxing moon, I've done it many times, and there was always something that didn't look real. Okay. I did a good job. I've sold pictures with moons like that, but there was something that bothered me. At three o'clock in the morning this morning, I discovered what it was. Today? Today. <laughs> the, All right. I'm, I'm still jet lagged. You know, I, I went, went to bed at 4.30 in the afternoon because I got back from China. Woke up at 12.30 in the morning, couldn't sleep, so I went to my computer, and I saw one of my night shots from China washed out moon, uh -huh. and I took another moon and r did something to it, and I go, that's it. What's it? When you have a moon that's bigger than a crescent, uh -huh. like a half moon, full moon, three-quarter moon, there's a glow around it, Okay. a very subtle glow in the sky. Mm -hmm. But when you cut and paste a moon in, you oh. don't have the glow. Ah, okay. So how do you put it, the glow back in? Well, I have to show you. Okay. It, it's too hard to just just to describe d describe it. Now, for those people who are watching the show or listening to the podcast, they're not going to be able to come tomorrow to Naples, Florida. Is there? Do you teach it, this kind of stuff online somewhere? <coughs> or well, actually, I'm going to write an article about this and show examples in my October issue of my my e magazine. Okay. Which is free. Anybody wants to subscribe to it? So they go to your website, <coughs> jimzuckerman.com, and, and then the there's a place to subscribe? At the bottom of the homepage, okay. it says sign up. Okay. And like I said, it's free. 
comes out once a month. And uh, I, I was so excited about this, this technique that I was going to write about it in the magazine. The October issue will be a few days late because I just got back from China. You're not even home yet. I'm not home yet. So um, hopefully maybe October 4th it'll go out. Uh, but so it'll, it, the article about this will be in there. Okay. So subscribe. I'm going to, if I didn't already. I think I may have already. <laughs> All right. Let me just, what do I want to ask you? We've got about 15 minutes left. So I want to ask you about time management because you are crazy. I mean, you're insane. You travel how many weeks a year? Would you say like 12 or 13 trips and they're two weeks each most yeah, of them? It, it, it That's a lot of travel. It adds up. And well, yet you get out this newsletter and, and this months. magazine and you're writing for other places and you're doing that. Okay, so how do, you, how do you do that? Well, I just do it. You, do you just I, work all the time? I work all the time. Um, I work all the time. I, s I usually stop. The, it depends on how soon my wife nags me to stop. Okay. Thank God for the wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she has to tear me away from the computer. You know, like one more email or, or one more something. Um, I usually stop around 9, 10 at night. Wow. And, and then we watch a movie and go to bed. Wow. Do you take days off? What's what's that? Ah! <laughs> a day off? I, so no. I, I, I've heard of that. <laughs> it sounds familiar. <laughs> you can't remember what that is, though. Oh my. No. Um, I've actually, in since 1972, had one vacation. Wow. Of course, people think that what I do for work is a vacation. But it's not. I I lead. I don't lead photo tours like you do, but I lead photo tours. I'm getting yeah. ready to lead one on Sunday, and it's exhausting. It is. It's, it's draining. You have a lot of responsibility. You're on all the time. Mm -hmm. And you have to take care of all the little details. You have to get up before everybody, go to bed after yes. everybody. I don't like details. Uh, my wife helps me a lot. Oh, okay. she, she does the bookings and the, and the, the flights. And uh, she, she does so much of the detail work, handles, handles all the money, that there's no way I could do that and do what I do. Okay. Um, but I still work all the time, you know, and, and then she, you know, y yells at me to cut the grass, you know, and to take care of stuff around the house, which I love to do, but... It's probably good for you, too. You know, it is. Do you um, need to get away from what I you're... So focused. I have on a sit-down lawnmower, you know, and I cruise oh, around that, uh, and and that that's that's fine. It gets me away from the computer. Yeah, I that's one of the problems I think with photography now. I I sit at the computer. Yeah, I mean, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and I. But they can do so much. I know, and you get sucked into it, you know. Y you do. I mean, China. I'm using Skype to call home, and you can do music with it. Of course, photography with it, information at your fingertips communication with anybody in the world right now. Incredible. I know. I know. So, but, but I, you do need to get away from it just to get blood flowing in your yeah. limbs and, and get refocused and re-energized when you and come I, back. And mowing the lawn is probably nice mindless work. It's probably something you need to do once in a it while. It is. Just I focus like on shut the mind off. You I know? focus on the rose. <laughs> that's right. Yes. That, that's exactly right. Wow. All right. This is part of our series. Okay. Top 10 tips. Uh, okay. Top I 10 tips for travel photographers. I knew you were going to ask me this, so I wrote down some tips. That's why I gave you that piece of paper. Okay, so top, uh, top tip tips for travel photography would be, first and foremost, research. Research what? The place? or Research what you want to photograph. Oh. Um, for example, the first time I went to Borneo, I'd never been there, and so I, I googled Borneo photos, mm -hmm. and uh, up pops a you know scores and scores of pictures, and I'd see one, I got to go there, and I got to go there, and then you look at a map and you plan your itinerary. Oh, okay. So, if you like to to photograph um, abandoned architecture, I discovered recently that in Europe there's just dozens of abandoned train stations Ooh, that and, sounds fun. And, and elegant homes that have fallen into ruin and palaces and all kinds of stuff that when you see the pictures you go, whoa, that's incredible. 
So if that's what you love to shoot, you know, architecture and ruins, you find out where they are and you, you put dots on a map and then you plan your trip. So that's number one. Oh, okay. We could go to our hometown and do that. Detroit. Uh, abandoned buildings. I have so many photography friends who live in Detroit and they get the coolest pictures from all the old abandoned buildings. I know. It's so dangerous, so. I know. <laughs> But it's dangerous. You have to research that too, don't you? How do you research if it's like a safe area? Well, y you can. You can uh, the State Department okay. has warnings of various places. But you I mean, like to go. S I want to go photograph this abandoned building. Well, no, they're they're not going to be that specific. Right. That's but, what I mean. But if you're in doubt, you hire a local guide. Mm -hmm. If you're in another country or another city. Um, uh, and they'll tell you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Number two. Number two is um, carry a tripod. Ah. People resist it. I know. Everybody hates I carrying a tripod. I don't like carrying it either, but it's essential for getting lots of kinds of pictures. Yeah. In dark environments like cathedral interiors, twilight, city skylines, all kinds of stuff. You know, long exposures, water getting uh, like like uh, really soft. Yeah. You know, Everybody that's all. Loves that. it's, it's it's all tripod, HDR, it's all tripod. Yeah, you're right. Um, that is good advice. Be aggressive and think outside the box. Okay. Meaning, if, if there's a sign that says no photos, <laughs> mm -hmm. that may not apply to you. <laughs> um, if, if, um, if there's a famous place that you want to shoot and they don't allow pictures, it doesn't mean you can't ask permission or pay some money to photograph. Okay. For example, um, in Florence, Italy, you've got the famous baptistry doors uh -huh. from the 15th century. And uh, on the, the, the right in front of them, there's a gate to keep people about four feet back. So you can't touch them. You can you can photograph them, but the gates the anyway. gate is blocking, you know, um, maybe three feet from three feet down. Okay, so I'm I'm sitting there looking at this, thinking, what if that gate can be removed? And I notice that there's a cut in the pavement where the gate can actually be lowered. Uh -huh. It didn't doesn't swing open, but it can be lowered. So I asked one of the security guards there. I said. Um, who can I talk to about having this gate lowered? He said, well, two blocks away, there's the office that manages this, this famous place. So I went there, and I said, I'm a photographer from America, and I just love to photograph the doors, you know, clean without the gate. Mm -hmm. I said, is that possible? Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was quite surprised. He said, when would you like to do this? Wow, just like that. Just like that. I said... How about tomorrow morning at 7, before many tourists come? Right. He said, okay. Ah. Just like that. So sometimes just ask. Sometimes just ask. In, in uh, Austria, I photographed, um, well, I went to an opera so I could photograph the opera house from the inside. Uh -huh. But there's lots of people and I couldn't use a tripod. And so I went to the uh, ticket office and I said, who, who can I speak to about photographing in the opera house? Uh, just me. Mm -hmm. And two blocks away was the office. I went there and um, they, they charged me $100. Now this, this was in the 90s, but so I paid $100. And when I was there, there was nobody else there. Mm -hmm. They turned all the lights on for me. Oh, wow. It was incredible. Wow. So, so think outside the box. Okay. You know, and, and be aggressive to get the pictures that you want to get. I like that. That's good advice. Um, make if, if you like shooting people, and of course, and see, the thing about travel, you can specialize in a certain aspect of travel, like people, uh -huh. or landscapes, or ruins, you know, all, uh, all kinds of things, archaeological sites. When Travel photography encompasses pretty much everything, er, every aspect of photography, right. macro, you know, you, every aspect. And so um, you have to decide what you want to focus on if you want to focus on, on one thing. 
And um, if you like to shoot people, you, you, you need to establish at least for a few moments some kind of human interaction, communication, smile, mm -hmm. take a picture, show them the back of the camera, and, and like especially with kids, they love it. Okay. You know, if it's an older person, um, just uh, if they're selling something, buy something small and, and learn, learn how to say thank you in their language. Just a little human communication and then ask to take their picture. Okay. It usually breaks down barriers. Okay. Don't just go up to them and say, hey, can I take your picture? And, and but st stick your f camera in their face. Yeah, okay. Yeah, first of all, it's rude. Yeah. And, y and you often get much better pictures when they're relaxed. Yeah. And they're enjoying being with you, too. Okay. 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 Um, let's say it on my glasses here. Uh, oh, use a wide-angle lens of effectively. Many people, beginners, intermediate f photographers, think of a wide-angle lens as it gets it all in. Uh -huh. Like, I'm going to include the whole Grand Canyon in this picture. Uh -huh. But there are many m better ways of using a wide-angle, like, for example, getting very physically close to your foreground, making it d disproportionately large to the background. Okay. Oh. It's a very dramatic way yeah. to do it. Okay? That or well, you have some columns, you get right below them and shoot up elongating them dramatically, okay. like that. Okay. Wide angle photography is fantastic. You can do portraits with wide angle too. Most people think, well, that's going to distort. Uh -huh. Well, it does, but in a very cool way. And you don't want to get too close so their face is distorted, unless you want something bizarre. Uh -huh. But for example, in Venice, I've done uh, people in carnival outfits with wide angle lenses, and it's just incredible. Is it? Really incredible. Okay. Do you have anything like that on your website? Oh, yeah, lots. Okay. All right, go ahead. Lots. Um, take advantage of twilight. Mm. Twilight is the most beautiful time to photograph cities, mm -hmm. uh, villages, but it's, it's beautiful skylines. When, when the sky goes cobalt blue and all the lights come on f of the buildings, that's, that's magical. Mm. And so all the great cities in the world you know, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, Paris, uh, monuments. Um, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, uh, Le, Mont Le Mont Saint Michel in, in northern France, Normandy. It's it's stunning at twilight. Okay. So that must do that. Okay. Twilight. Number six. Um, learn to use a flash. Mm. Flash scares people. I know. And, you know, it's understandable because you can't see with your eyes th what, what it mean? looks like until yeah. you take the picture. And then it could be too late. And uh, most people put the flash on top of the camera, and that's the least attractive kind of artificial light we have. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is learn how to use it off camera. Three quarters, side, backlighting. Uh, that that expands your creativity significantly. Mm. Uh, number seven. Um, let's see if I can read my own writing. <laughs> um, can you read that word? <laughs> um, you're talking to somebody who can't read anything okay. without glasses. So. Look for, um, oh, yes, got it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, look for elevated perspectives top of a tall building. Oh, you mean so you can shoot down? So you can shoot down. Ah. I often look for rooftop restaurants oh, okay. or rooftop observation decks or cafes or uh, hills that you can climb or drive up to. Uh, it's I elevated perspectives are very powerful. Okay. If you're doing an article, they give, give you establishing photograph, doing a slideshow. It's the opening slide. You know, here's the area where I was. Now here's the details. Okay. Mm, I like it. Um, respect other cultures. Mm. Very important. Mm, okay. Don't be um, rude, impolite, offensive. You know, if you're going to go to Thailand, learn that you don't raise your voice in anger. You don't touch somebody on the top of the head. Okay. Things like that. So do a little research on that, too. Yeah. Okay. Just cultural sensitivities okay. goes a long way. Right. Okay. That makes 
And then we have, oh, last one, learn Photoshop. Ah. <laughs> if you want to make great travel pictures, you need to learn Photoshop to make them better than you took them. Mm, I agree with that. I love Photoshop. Yes, okay. <laughs> and then you're going to ask me about what five mistakes I think people make right. in what's photography. Right, what's the most common five mistakes? Okay, here's my list. That you see. Yes, All not right. enough depth of field. Ah. Um, a lot of people think out of focus is great much of the time or all the time. I don't. I think great detail is great. Okay. And, I, and one of the mistakes I see is people um, not taking the time to use a tripod in small aperture or a flash in small aperture or making, if you're doing, let's say, photographing um, artwork in, in, a, in, a, in a museum, uh -huh. uh, um, it, it, you, you have to make the back of the camera parallel to the wall mm -hmm. to, make, to make, ensure you have all the depth of field you want. Okay. Um, if, if you shoot oblique, you have a depth of field problem. Right. So just details like that. Okay. okay so depth, depth of field. Of field. I, I think most people don't have enough of it. Okay, that's, that's um, interesting. Distracting backgrounds. Okay, that's... That's a big one. Yeah, especially when you're doing all this travel photography, I would imagine people just don't... Train, well, what do they need to train their eye, right? You need to train your eye. It's, it's two, two parts. You need to train your eye to see when a background is going to be bad. And if you can, you fix it at the time. Uh -huh. You change your shooting angle have the, the person move, for example, or two, you replace it with another background using Photoshop. Okay. Uh, for example, when I was in, in the Ephesus Museum in Turkey, uh, they had some stunning 2,000-year-old Roman sculptures sitting in the museum. Well, you take a picture of, of the statues, and the background is the museum. And people and, and people and other yeah. statues and the wall and signs. Yeah. It's horrible. It, it, it ruins the shot. So you select the statue uh -huh. and then, then you, sl you select the inverse so you got the background now. And now you put a gradient of color like it's a studio oh, okay. or black or something else. Just to make it. To, to make it perfect. You, you go to a classic car show. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have a whole bunch busy. of classic cars. There's other cars, people, vendors, and these cars are so beautiful. Well, I replaced the whole background with a landscape or a European cityscape. Yeah. And, and now, now, now the, the, the photograph is a work of art that, that complements the car. Okay. Number three is um, contrasty lighting. People don't pay enough attention to light. When the sun is high in the sky, it's a blue sky, the light is just too contrasty. Okay. And so you should not shoot at midday unless your subject is in the shade, mm -hmm. or you can move it in the shade, or you do some other techniques that deal with contrasty light. But, um, it now, but what if you're on a tour or a trip or whatever, and then you're going to try to move your subject is what you're saying. Yes. Or you're going to get up early. You, you get up early and use dawn light, sunrise lighting, sunset lighting. When it's cloudy, you can shoot all day, certainly people, animals. But then if it's cloudy, you run the risk of the sky being white. Yeah. That's why you need to learn Photoshop. Ah. Okay? <laughs> it all comes back to learning Photoshop. <laughs> it, it does. Number four, uh, a big mistake is shooting things that are not interesting. Okay. Great subjects make great pictures. Assuming that, that you photograph them well uh -huh. and the lighting is good, if your subject is boring, the picture will be boring. Yeah. Okay, very important. It's like, it's like if you shoot a brown butterfly, good depth of field, good exposure, good color, good background, but it's a brown butterfly, the picture will be quote, nice. Mm -hmm. If you shoot an iridescent butterfly, iridescent blue, mm. same, same technical, mm -hmm. you know, 
comparison, people will go, wow, what a great shot. Oh, so because it's, it's neon blue. So brown, you're but right. But brown, brown is, no, that's nice. Okay. You see? Good point. That's a I, really good point. Let me give you one other analogy. Okay. If you were old enough and had access to take a picture of Marilyn Monroe whispering something into President Kennedy's ear and they were both giggling, uh -huh. it would be considered a Pulitzer Prize winning picture. You'd make a fortune. Right. And it'd be in all, it'd be reproduced a bazillion times. Bazillion it'd places. It'd be on posters, it'd be in the magazines. You're right. But if you had a picture of my wife whispering into my ear and we were both giggling, be a nice picture for our family album. That's it. You're right. See? Oh, that's a good, that's a really good example. Subject matter. Yeah. Seek out, that, this is what I've done my entire life. That, that's why my photography tours go to great places. I'm constantly seeking out awesome things to shoot. Not nice things, awesome. not pretty good things. Okay. Awesome. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's really good. That was your number five? Nope, number four. Oh, okay. Last one is, um, a lot of people handhold the camera with the shutter speed too slow, mm -hmm. and their pictures aren't sharp. Okay, that's my exact, my main one that and, I see too. And y you know what they do? The, the, they're using aperture priority, and they think, oh, let me get really good depth of field, f11, f16, f22. They take the picture, and they can hear their shutter speed isn't fast enough, and their picture's blurred, mm -hmm. and by the time they fiddle with their camera, they've lost th the shot. Mm -hmm. Or they're using a telephoto lens and their shutter's not fast enough. Mm -hmm. The rule of telephotos is you, the, the shutter speed should be the reciprocal of the focal length. Okay. So if the focal length is 400 millimeter, the shutter speed should be at least a 1 400th or faster. If it's not, you run the risk of Pictures that are maybe almost sharp, mm. just enough to drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Like the perfect picture, but not not tag not, sharp. That's right. And you know, this is where image stabilization comes in. I image stabilization is important, uh -huh. especially with long lenses, but also especially in low light situations when you can't use a tripod. So, like for example, in a museum, I mean, most museums don't allow tripods. Right. And so. Um, you have a choice of raising the ISO, which you don't like to do, or if you have an image stabilized lens that's, let's say, a three or four f-stop stabilization, you can get away with a 30th, a 15th even. I did one shot in the Vatican with a, um, a 200 millimeter focal length at a tenth of a second. With a tenth of a second handheld, no oh. tripods allowed, oh my God. image stabilized, and I was amazed it was sharp now I held my breath I just, you know planted Did my you feet go against a wall I leaned against yeah. a, a column actually try to stabilize myself but still uh, Tenth of a second though that's pretty slow it's very slow for I a tried, long lens like that I tried an eighth and it wasn't sharp oh my god but a tenth it was wow so image stabilization is very important to, to help you get sharp pictures when your shutter speed isn't as fast as, as you'd like so, was that number six? Because I want to continue on that. Yeah. I have another question about that. Yeah, go ahead. Or five. Uh, five. Uh, many. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, a lot of instructors teach to shoot in aperture priority. I am not one of them. I'm not one of them either. Okay. Okay, okay look at Aperture, uh, all of these exposure modes ha have their place. I use program a lot, uh -huh. and people are horrified that I do because, okay. you know, you use program. You know, why let the camera make all the decisions? It's not making all the decisions. I'm watching what it's doing. Uh -huh. If it's doing what I don't want it to do, I change. Mm -hmm. But aperture priority is, is what you need when you do landscapes and you're on a tripod. When you want complete depth of field, for like F32, uh -huh. and you don't care what the shutter speed is because you're on a tripod. Right. Aperture priority. Aperture priority can also be used if you want the fastest shutter speed possible. Then you use the largest aperture, mm -hmm. and that forces the shutter speed to be really fast. Okay? Okay. Program is good when you don't want to think about it because things are happening too fast. In a festival, carnival, 
Right. People are dancing and moving, and you don't have time to fiddle. So you put right, on program right, right. and let, let the, the camera do it. Program is designed to give you the fastest shutter speed possible minus a third. Okay. And so if you're on program, and y you can see what your shutter speed is, uh -huh. if it's not fast enough, you raise your ISO. Okay, so program has this place. Uh, shutter priority has a place if you specifically want a certain shutter speed, mm -hmm. like for a waterfall. I want that at four seconds. Mm. Set at four seconds. Okay. Okay. And manual has a place. Many, many instructors teach that you shoot on manual. Absolutely not, because it slows you down. Right. W you, you can't shoot wildlife with manual. Not, not no. Or, or anything fast. Mm -hmm. But use manual for things like lightning, special situations. Um, well, portrait photography. You like, we always shoot a manual for portraits. Well, well you, right? you mean in a studio? Portraits, weddings. Well, weddings, well. I it, mean, they don't move that fast in a wedding. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you can control your subject, you can shoot on manual. Um, f for sure. I shoot, I shoot manual when I'm doing macro flash. Mm. Okay, I, I do a, a frog and reptile workshop twice a year in St. Louis. And I have people, we, we use ring flashes or, or twin flash macro setups. Okay. And I tell them to use F32, the camera on manual, and the flash on ETTL or ITTL. Whatever, yeah. Um, because that's the automatic exposure mode for the flash. And the way the camera and flash talk to each other, the flash knows you at F32. And it gives you the amount of light that you need for F32. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. So manual, and but the automatic function on the flash is active. Right. See? I like so, it. So manual has its place. So they all have their place is what you're saying. Well, when I do off-camera flash, uh, like in Carnival in Venice, I'm on manual. Right. Well, with flash, a lot of times I think you need to shoot uh, in manual. Correct. More often than correct. other that's right. types of things. So, Wow, that's good. So what's coming up? What's coming up for Jim Zuckerman? Well, I have another photography tour. I'll be leaving in about five days, six, about six days. You just got back from China yesterday. I well, know. no, you're not even back yet. No, well, that's true. I'm not. You flew? Di How long did it take you to get to Detroit? From China. From 12 and a half hours from Shanghai. You spent the night in Detroit and then flew to Florida today. To, d to do the presentation tomorrow. And the show today. And then, then and the show today and then, then go home. So. Wow. And then you yeah. leave a few days later. Yeah. American Southwest, that's 10 days. Then I'm home for two weeks. And then I have the Pantanal in Brazil. Wow. And that's always exciting. Do you have openings for that tour? Um, I out? have one opening. Okay. Brazil. And then I do a trip to Cuba. That, oh. That's just a week or eight days. And then... then. When are you going to Cuba? Uh, middle, middle November. Oh, that's a beautiful time to go. And then nothing until January, which oh, is... Oh, like a whole month off. Big yeah, deal. Yeah, month and a half. In January, it's snowy owls. This, oh. is, this is the third year I've done snowy owls, and it keeps selling out. Those birds are beautiful. It's cold. Where is that? It's it's an hour north of Toronto in Canada. Ooh, that is cold. In January? In January. I went to uh, one time when I lived in Detroit. My girlfriend and I took the train to Toronto for New Year's Eve. It's <laughs> really, really cold in January. <laughs> it Wear is. Wear a big snowsuit. Can you rent those? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, you probably can somewhere. I'm um, just curious because those things keep you warm. They do. The, the problem are fingers and toes. Oh, yeah. Um, for fingers, I have a great solution. And for toes, you need serious winter boots. Um, I, did a I did some wildlife photography in eastern Canada many years ago. And it was um, minus 45. Um, one, one day it was minus 57 with no wind chill. This was straight. And <sighs> my, my boots... It, my boots were rated to minus 40, and my toes got cold. Oh, my gosh. And, and I, you know, if your fingers get cold, you can use hand warmers. You can put them, like, in your armpits. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but your toes get cold. You can't do anything yeah. about them. Okay. Except go in the house, you know. Right. So I said, this is never going to happen to me again. And I got boots rated at minus 100. 
So they rate boots for yeah. stuff like that? Yeah. Wow, I didn't even know that. And um, I feel like Godzilla when I walk in these things. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, and and uh, last, last year, I wore them on the plane because oh, they're heavy. They're heavy and takes up, they're monster boots. And, you know, half my, three quarters of my luggage is are the boots, so I wore them. Oh my God. And, and uh, it, it was sort of funny going through security. <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, it's, 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 it's weird. But anyway, so, so Canada sells it all the time. In spite of the cold, wow. the pictures are really beautiful. It's worth it. It's worth it. White owls with yellow eyes on white snow. I've seen pictures, but I've never seen one. It sounds amazing. So Now, all of this information is going to be in the show notes on understandphotography.com. We'll have Jim's website, any website things that we talked about today. Um, you can, if you're in Southwest Florida or nearby, Jim will be giving a lecture at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning at Florida Southwestern College Naples campus. That's probably where you get messed up because their main campus is in Fort Myers. Oh, that's what it is. So we're in the Naples campus. Okay. Um, the information on that is going to be in the show notes and on our Facebook page right underneath this uh, post. And then at 1.30, right? Is yes. it 1.30? Yes, 1.30 to 4.30. 1.30 to 4.30, Jim is going to be teaching a Photoshop class. And it's only $35. So if you're local or if you're in Southwest Florida, come on down. He's going to teach you how to do that grassy thing that he talked about. <laughs> okay, so next week, I mentioned that I'm going to be leading a photo trip to St. Croix. But that's not going to stop us. We're going to be doing the Understand Photography show live from St. Croix. I'll be intervie interviewing David Berg, who is uh, an artist and an underwater photographer. I've known David for quite a few years now. Uh, and he's pretty amazing. He's done a TEDx talk and everything, and he's a young, young man. So thank you for being our guest today. Appreciate You're very welcome. it. Thank you for asking me. And we will see you next week. Friday, Eastern, 4 o'clock Eastern time on the Understand Photography Show.